Good morning and welcome to this middle Sunday of camp. So with a the theme of grace, may it fill your hearts on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning at South Seaville Camp Meeting. Let's go to the Lord and let's be fed. Today represents the midpoint of this 2020 camp meeting. We thank all for your participation in the first week of, of camp. In the second week, we're going to focus on this morning's service with Pastor Stephen Parkhill, the upcoming morning devotionals in the second week by Pastor Jack Orr, evening services by Pastors Sean Callender Hogan and Kirk Kenny and we'll conclude with Saturday board and women's auxiliary meetings.
During this middle Sunday, we'll have an opening prayer by Pastor Brian Roberts. He's the district superintendent of the Cape Atlantic District of the United Methodist Church. Pastor Brian has been instrumental in helping to revive the church nights and the organization nights we've had over the last couple of years. Welcome, Pastor Brian. Hello, South Seville Camp Meeting. It's such a joy to uh, be with you today uh, via technology. I would be there in person to celebrate the 2020 camp meeting season. I thank uh, the South Seville Camp Meeting Board, uh, all your leadership, all of you, for finding ways to continue to share God's grace in the midst of a very challenging global uh, pandemic and issues that face our nation. Your camp meeting started right in the aftermath of the Civil War as a nation was coming together uh, seeking to rebuild. We are United Methodists, united in Christ and methodically seeking to make a difference in God's world. And the camp meeting movement was a part of our heritage. It's a part of our spiritual DNA. And it's more important than ever that we mine that spiritual DNA, that we unpack the energy to be a movement of God's unfathomable, amazing grace in a time like this, where people can unite across their differences and find the power of God's love that opens us to listen deeply to God and to each other, to find a way to work together to uh, lift up this nation once again, uh, to share uh, in ways that bring hope and love and peace and justice to all so that we indeed uh, have liberty and justice for all. I thank all of the cottagers, all of you that are part of the South Steeple Camp Meeting. I thank all of those that are worshiping uh, today online and all the congregations that are hosting. I, I believe over 35 congregations signed up early in the year to be hosts, pastors and communities of faith, remembering our connectional ministry to lift up Christ together. May God bless uh, the 2020 season so that we can see God more clearly working in our hearts, our lives, our families, and through the South Seville Camp Meeting Association to bless God's world. Amen. This is the time in the service for our generosity moment. The Bible teaches us to give freely. So this is a gifting request actually for a combination of the offering plate and the love gifts, which are the key engine for continuing our efforts here at South Seville Camp Meeting. Now each year we've picked a focus area in the first five year plan of reviving the buildings. So we worked on Cox Hall, the Hospitality House, Oak Hall, and Wright Hall. So as you consider your gift for this year, the focus for the next couple of years likely will be the tabernacle, where we're going to consider the structure, the screens, the paint, perhaps even e-enablement for future years to reach out past the, the borders of our camp meeting. Exodus in chapter 35, we see the Israelites giving generously materials in their time and efforts to build the tabernacle. So friends, let's do this here. Let generosity be in your heart and give freely to continue the great works here at South Seville Camp Meeting. Friends, I had the opportunity to meet Pastor Steve Parkhill just a few years ago. An early riser, he's frequently in the tabernacle by 6 a.m. praying and walking the aisles. I've had many opportunities to sit down and talk to him. He joined us last year as a new cottager, which I mentioned during the opening service last week. But he's not new to the Lord, and he's not new to the campground. Passionate, kind, a friend, and a servant leader. Let's welcome Pastor Steve Parkhill. We're so glad that you joined us today. We have been looking over the last number of days at the concept of grace. I want to start off and share just a little bit. Back in 1830, there was a man by the name of George Wilson. And George Wilson had, in robbing a U.S. postal uh, event, had actually killed someone and had been sentenced to death.
Because of that, he had uh, been tried and he was to be executed, to be hanged. The president at the time was a man by the name of Andrew Jackson, and uh, he had actually extended a pardon to Wilson, but he refused. Wilson refused to receive the pardon from Jackson. Well, what do you do? This had never been something that had ever been experienced or that they confronted before. And so what they actually did was they turned it over to the Supreme Court Chief Justice Marshall. And after reviewing the case, his conclusion was this. He said, a pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. And he was. That is amazing because who would refuse a pardon when you were sentenced to death? But the reality, the question that we should ask ourselves is, how can we refuse and reject grace? After all, who doesn't need grace? Today, just simply for the sake of simplicity, I want us to distill down and take a condensed look at grace into three different aspects of what grace looks like for us, or more specifically, the three phases of grace in our life. The first of these is the grace to be saved initially. Paul, who was uh, a tremendous result of God's grace in his own life, shared this out of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to read verses 4 through 10. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to all in future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Just to, to really look at a snapshot, grace is God's unmerited favor, as we have heard, that has been given to us. I heard someone else that shared that is grace is God's ability in us to do that, which we cannot do ourselves. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't buy it. Grace is a gift from God. There was an active, dedicated, hardworking church member one time that died in uh, uh, when this gentleman approached the pearly gates, he noticed a sign there uh, that was posted outside uh, of heaven, and it said, entrance requirement, 1,000 points. When St. Peter appeared, the man asked, how, how do you get these points? And St. Peter said, well, this, what good things have you done in your life? Well, the man thought, and then he began uh, to enumerate some of those things. Well, I was baptized as a believer in Christ for 32 years. I didn't miss a Sunday service for 14 years. And I taught Sunday school for more than 12 years. St. Peter said, well, wonderful. That's one point. The man gulped, and he went on, and he said, well, I also tithe my income, and I served on the finance committee, the building committee. I was an elder in the church, 
that they ever had a fellowship supper, they always knew that they could count on me. I would set chairs and tables up, and I would run errands for the preacher. And St. Peter again said, wonderful, that's worth another point. By this time, uh, the man was perspiring, and he said, I also recruited people for the church. I, I literally knew everyone in the church. I always tried to make everyone feel comfortable and welcome. I took kids to camp and on and on. St. Peter said, well, great. That's worth another point. Now you've got three. Well, worry showed all over this man's face. And with a note of resignation, he said, well, that entrance requirement is awfully tough. I don't believe anybody could get in there without the grace of God. And St. Peter said, ah, oh, that's worth 997 points. You see, it's not what we do, but it's who we know. The relationship with Jesus Christ. Without grace, you and I can't even come to the point where we are able to see the need of what we have. It's been said that the first step in overcoming any problem is to recognize that there is a problem in the first place. Some of you may have heard of and maybe even read the book, I'm Okay, You're Okay. A man by the name of Thomas Anthony Harris had penned it, and it literally was a, a self-help book uh, that uh, really, when you look at the overview of it, misses the whole point of the fact that in our own condition, just the way we are without God, we are not okay. We need a Savior. My wife is uh, a history major. My father-in-law was a history major. Uh, our whole family, we enjoy things of history and uh, different uh, portions of that. And there was a movie by the name of Saving Private Ryan. Maybe you've heard it, familiar with it. And in that, uh, a group of army rangers is sent out because uh, there is one woman whose family, she has three sons, and uh, two of them have been killed. And so he is the one surviving child that's left, a son. And so uh, these rangers set out with a mission going deep into enemy territory, looking for Private Ryan. On their way there, they hit skirmish after skirmish. They, uh, some of them even end up being killed along the way. And they finally get to the place where Private Ryan is holed up, and they say, come with us. And he looks at them, and uh, after they've told him that they were here to save him, he said, I can't go. He said, there is... Uh, an impending battle that's coming, and I cannot abandon my fellow soldiers for that. Well, what did they do? That whole group of rangers joins in, and they uh, settle in for the battle that ensues. And literally, almost everyone is killed in that battle except Private Ryan. The, the person, the lead person of the rangers that's played uh, in this by Tom Hanks, he's been shot and he's sitting there and he's in the process of dying and uh, Private Ryan reaches uh, over him after the battle has been won and in the midst of that uh, this character played by Tom Hanks said earn this but if you know anything about the army and especially the rangers that would be something that they would never say because they had given their life. It was uh, rather than earn this, it's something that I choose in order to bring uh, deliverance and to bring you back to the place of safety. You know, the same thing is for us. If we were to roll back time and look at Jesus as he hung there on the cross, we would never hear from his lips earn this. As a matter of fact, uh, he chose that for you and me. It's not something that we would have to earn or that we even could earn, but it was something that he chose so that we could have salvation and be with him for eternity. That is so, so important. You see, God's grace 
is a beginning grace. It's the place where life for us, that is life, new life, actually begins. So the first thing is that it is grace initially. The second thing is it is grace to be served, saved eternally. For you and I, uh, we understand that God's grace is eternal. It will last on for ages without end. Paul wrote in Titus 3.7, uh, and I'm reading out of the T.E. Uh, version. It says, so that by his grace we might be put right with God and come into possession of the eternal life we hoped for. The message translation uh, renders it like this. God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come and eternity of life. Aren't you thankful that God's grace never runs out? It is forever and ever. Paul said this again in Ephesians 2, 7. He did this to demonstrate, to prove, to uh, uh, give us the, the understanding for all time to come, the extraordinary greatness of his grace in the love he showed us in Christ Jesus. It is a grace that is eternal. We've looked at the starting place for grace in our life uh, to be saved. We've looked at the ending uh, that we will, uh, really I should say without ending, that grace will last on and on in our lives, our eternal lives. But the point that I want to spend the most time in today is I want us to look that it is grace to be saved immediately. In the here and now, it's the in the middle part in order to sustain us, the, the one that is continuing right now. You see, God is in process. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1, So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing uh, you can do for Him. Paul went on to say to the writing to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 12, in verses 7 through 9, because of this extravagance of these revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, Paul said, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he, in fact, did was push me to my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that. And then he told me, my grace is enough. My grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into your own, in your weakness. Once I heard it, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving on in my weakness. You see... God got us started with grace, and God will finish us with grace. But what about this part of our life that we walk out called the Christian walk, the, the Christian life? It gets hard. It's challenging. We've just gone through uh, the first part of this challenge with COVID, and uh, there's still resurgences of it at, from place to place. And so what do we do in the midst of the hard times of this thing called life? There's a, an account from World War I. There was a British commander, and uh, they actually had been on furlough, and he was leading his soldiers back in, and as they dredged their way back in through the mud and uh, through uh, uh, puddles of blood and things that are around and facing possible death, nobody talked. Nobody sang. It was a heavy time. As they marched along, the commander uh, actually looked into the bombed-out back part of a church over to his right. And as he marched, he saw there hanging still from the cross, Christ crucified. It did something inside of him. And as he marched along, he realized the importance. And so he ordered all of his troops to eyes right march. 
And the whole group turned their eyes, and as they marched by and looked into the back of the cross and saw uh, what the crucified Christ, the representation of his death, it brought a revived uh, hope and encouragement inside of them, and they took courage in their life, and they, their shoulders straightened, and they began to smile as they went along. You see, anything uh, worth living in life, it has risks that demand danger for us. Life can be hard, but we have one who walks with us. The author to Hebrews said this in chapter 4, verse 16, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God that we will receive His mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. What do you need help with today? He's there. Not only is God in the process, but God is in the preparation inside of our life. There was a university piano teacher uh, he is simply, he went by Herman. And uh, one day they had had a, a university concert and they brought in uh, a, a distinguished piano player. And while he was doing a, an extremely difficult piece, this pianist, the guest pianist, became very ill and had to stop uh, part of the way through the, the performance. When he had ushered off, Herman got up from the crowd from where he was sitting, and he walked up, and he sat down at the piano, and there he played this difficult piece masterfully without challenge. And so later on, they were at a party that night, and one of his students came up to him, and he said, how, without any practice, without any kind of of uh, knowledge and advance, how could you play this with such preciseness? And so Herman began to recount to him. The year was uh, in the, the, the 1930s, 1939. He was uh, a, a budding young pianist at that time, and he was arrested and he was placed in a Nazi concentration camp. To put it mildly, his future looked extremely bleak. But he knew that in order to keep the flicker of hope of what he, his future could possibly look like, that one day he might be able to play again when he would lay there on his hard bed of just plain boards. The first night he began to uh, tap out with his fingers from memory one of the songs from his repertoire. And then in the ensuing nights, he would add another and another. And then he would go over those. No piano before him, nothing but his memory in order to keep his skill sharp. And he would go over that and over that. And this difficult piece that he played this night was one of those pieces. You see, we don't always know what God is doing in our life. What may seem to be challenging and uh, may be a process, God is in the, the, the means of preparation to prepare us for what He has coming. And it may come in an instant, in a moment when we have no time to prepare. The Bible says to be ready instant, in season, and out of season. We have to be ready to do that. Not only is God in the process, not only is he in the preparation, but he is in the perseverance. Holding to it, staying there. There was an old farmer who had a mule, and you may have heard uh, this story. And this mule, during one of the days, actually fell down into a well. The farmer tried as best he could and could not get this mule out. And uh, finally, in, in a, 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 a just a decision of desperation. He told his boys, he said, I want you to go get uh, a load of dirt. And so uh, being obedient, they went and got the, the truckload of dirt and they backed it up and uh, the boys pulled out the shovel and the first shovel they took and they threw uh, a shovel of dirt 
much to the donkey's surprise. It hit him in the head and it filled his eyes and his nostrils and uh, it was a shock. Well, then after that came another shovel of dirt and this landed on his back and uh, what he simply did was he shook it off and he began to walk around and shovel after shovel after shovel of dirt came in and as he did, he just simply shook it off and he stamped it down. And that continued on for the biggest part uh, of the middle part of the day. And finally, in one desperation, and they were almost out of dirt, the, the mule had so packed it out that he was raised to the point where he shook the last off and stepped out of the well. You and I, no matter what life throws at us, we've got to shake it off and we've got to trust until we get to the point that God wants us to be at. You and I, we cannot stop. You see, God's grace is there in the beginning. Bring salvation. It's there in the end that we will live for eternity. And it's there with us through the journey. I want to share one last story with you. In the corner of a, a churchyard, in a place called Olney Parish Church, there's a large tombstone there, and this inscription is on it. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel in Libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh, preserved, restored, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. You see, John Newton was the son of a sea captain. And when he was uh, six, his mother died, and he went to sea with his father. Uh, after seven or, uh, several years of school, he, uh, at, at, at age 11, uh, he came to that point where he was with his father. Immorality, debauchery, and failure ensued during his time there. And finally, he was rejected by his father and finally ended up in jail and degraded he served on a slave ship uh, and, and finally, at one point in time, incurred uh, the hatred of his employer's wife. But he came to a point. He was reading a book called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, uh, the great German preacher from the 13 and 1400s. And at this point in time, he gave his heart to Jesus. At age 39, he became a minister of the gospel. And he, was, he pastored here at this church, an only church, for 15 years. And he was a, uh, wrote many hymns. But perhaps one that you and I know the most is this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind but now I see.
Let's close these services with a review of the second week of e-activities, which you have shown here. So the morning devotionals for the second week, Monday through Friday, will be led this week by Pastor Jack Orr. Pastor Jack's taking over where Pastor Steve left off last week. The evening services will be held at 7.30 at night on Sunday through Friday night. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday night, the message will be provided by Pastor Sean Callender Hogan. And on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday night, by Pastor Kurt Kinney. These two have graciously agreed to work together and provide a, the second week of evening services, three by each of the pastors. There's also women's outings summarized here on Thursday, July 23rd. Please meet at the barn for the women's outing. And on the 25th are both the board of directors meeting and the women's auxiliary meeting, both at 10 o'clock. So you can see we have a fairly active second week of eCamp. Please join us for each of them. Have a blessed day.